here we are again. Just want to just say that we are thinking of all of our Lake Point family, those who are not able to be with us. And I know that there are some of us that don't even have internet. Uh, Pastor Bruce is working diligently on getting uh, DVDs for those that don't have internet and getting those out to people. And uh, we have right now uh, many volunteers who are calling and offering their time to help uh, in our in any way that they can with our church. So we're working closely with Oxford Township and helping anybody that uh, may need to get to the store or to the pharmacies or to wherever. So just want to give you kind of that update just to let you know that uh, the pastors and the elders of this church, we've actually divvied up all the names of all the people uh, that are uh, attenders of Lake Point and members, and we are either going to be calling you and praying for you or, or both. So we want you to know that we are thinking of you during this time. Now, I do have to bring up, it's kind of the uh, elephant in the room, but we'll talk about it anyway. We do still need your support and your giving in any way that you can. I know some of us have lost our jobs and have been laid off. and I completely understand that. So uh, I just want to put that out. Whatever you are able to give to the church, you can still give. Uh, you can go right to our website at lakepointcc.org and click on the giving tab, which is in the upper right-hand corner, and give whatever you can at this time. And uh, our prayers are with you, and our prayers are with all of the families right now. So be blessed, and we will hopefully see you very soon. Good morning. Welcome to Lake Point. We're so glad you could be with us today. I brought some friends to sing with me and help me out this week. I just want you at home just to take a breath, quiet your heart, focus the eyes of your heart on Christ, who he is in our lives, his goodness to us, his great mercy, the faithfulness of the Father. Thank you, God. Bye. 
Let's open up with a word of prayer. Father, we look to you today. We look to you and we pray that you would help us during this time. During this time of great need. We need not to understand. We need your wisdom. We need your mind in all of this. As the prayer team has prayed this morning so diligently for the people of this place, of this church, of this state, and of this nation, that you would guide us, Father God, and help us to keep our eyes on you and move us forward in what you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Just want to welcome everybody here this morning. Thank you for joining us on uh, our website or on Facebook or wherever you have found this morning's message. We're continuing in a series on the book of James. Once again this week, I thought to myself, maybe I should uh, try to change uh, my message. But looking over it and studying it, and preparing for it, I noticed it's still a message, I think, that is something that we need to hear as a church, as a nation, as a people that are still focusing on the Lord during this time. So, let's go ahead and start this up. A young man once approached a wise sage and asked him how he could find wisdom and how he could find knowledge. Follow me, the sage said. And he led the man down to the sea, and he led him into the water, and as they started to get further and further in the water, he suddenly grabbed the young man and plunged his head under the water and held him. The young man struggled desperately, and just before he was about to black out, just before he was about to pass out, the sage pulled him up, and gasping for breath, the young man said to him, were you trying to kill me? No, responded the sage, but when you want wisdom and insight as badly as you desire breath, you will find it. And it's true. James is talking about that in his fourth chapter that we're looking at today. Desire comes in many different forms. Not all desires are wrong, but not all of them are right either. And James talks about having a strong desire in this fourth chapter of his epistle. He simply says in James chapter 4, 2, he says, You lust and do not have. Now James is speaking to lust, but he's not just speaking it as a sexual lust. He's speaking it as a strong desire of something that we cannot have but are so consumed with the need, or by the need to have it, we get completely distracted. We get distracted for a lust for what life has to offer, this lust for life. So this message will focus on this lust or this intense desire and how it distracts us from the things of God and I will use a comparison study. I want to look at Adam and Eve in Genesis and the temptation of Christ and how humility can help us overcome this temptation of the lust for life. Here's how the Apostle John summarized it in his first book. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. See, James teaches us, James teaches us that true faith produces fruit. True faith produces fruit. We've been looking over this the last couple weeks in our study. If there is faith, but it has no actions with a life change, that faith is ultimately a dead faith. It is not a living faith, it's a dead faith. He asks us, in chapter 2, 20, James asks us this rhetorical question, but he's asking the people of God, the church, do you want to be shown that faith without actions is useless? 
He's asking, do you want to learn, do you want to see that if you don't have action in your faith, if you don't live it out loud, it is a useless faith. It's a dead faith. So James writes to believers who know the suffering and who have faced trials. And ultimately, he writes to those who desire a deeper relationship with God rather than for those things that life has to offer. These are the things that can distract us. And it's written to those who desire to live their faith out loud. So the last few weeks, uh, I've, I've kind of preached uh, in chapter one, uh, was the payoff of problems. Different trials, different things in our lives, and we looked at the payoff of those problems. I Going back over it and kind of reviewing that week, that message, man, it's, it really resounds now, uh, the payoff of problems. But also week two, we talked about faith in action. And then last week, we talked about washing or watching your tongue. So keeping with this series theme that faith without works is dead, one of the barriers that can restrain us from living a life out loud is lust. And not just a sexual lust, as I said, but a lust for power or a lust for money or a lust for things we cannot have. And the list goes on and on. Some may call it greed, or some may call it hoarding, or whatever, but it's for something that we cannot have, and these things happen in different parts of our lives. So why is lust a sin? Why is lust even really considered a sin? Why is it wrong to desire something so badly? Well, typically... Lust is a sin, and this is the primary focus. You can follow along in your notes, especially uh, when you're watching at home. You can go on to uh, the Bible app and look for events and find us on there, and you'll see uh, the notes for today's lesson. But the primary focus of lust is self. It's about self. And Christians are to be marked by selflessness. Not selfishness. We are to place God before ourselves. God before me. Like it says in 2 Timothy, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. So we're not supposed to focus on ourselves. We're supposed to focus on God first and and then others before ourselves, others before me. Philippians 2.4, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also the interests of others. We are to have a part in this. It is God, others, and yourself. But when we put the primary focus upon ourselves, we're the primary focus, this is when it becomes a sin. Lust, says theologian Frederick Beekner, is the craving for salt of a man who's dying of thirst. When desire goes unchecked, we want the things that we don't even need We begin to go for things that we only want and we actually can deny some of the needs in our lives for the things that we want, which is to our detriment. This is what James goes on to explain in chapter 4. Read along with me, chapter 4, 1 through 6. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. 
Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Here are some of my observations from that portion of scripture. The first one that I observe is that intense desires come from within. Intense desires come from within us. James is asking, what is causing the quarrels and the fights and the wars among you? Don't they come from the evil desires within you? Aren't you at war with yourself first? He further explains that we want so badly what we don't have so that we'll scheme and even kill to get it. That our jealousies of what others have is driving us to fight and wage war to take it from them. And this might not be in the physical sense, but sometimes it can be even in just the spiritual sense. But he's exposing that how we think and feel on the inside drives our outward actions. So the first is that an intense desire comes from within. Secondly, James says that we ask for things, we ask with wrong motives. When we ask the Lord out of our personal pleasure or our gain, our selfishness, James is saying that this is wrong. <clears throat> Lord, bless me. Lord, give to me. Lord, help me. Now, it's not wrong for those of us to pray that, to say, Lord, bless me and give to me and help me. But we must add that little addendum to that so that I can be a blessing and a giver and a helper to others. We cannot just store up in our own lives, our own things, and not give them out. That's the wrong motivation. And that's what James is talking about there. The third thing that I see is that we are covenant breakers. <laughs> we break covenants. I know I do. I know I have, especially with my God. But we must realize that friendship with the world makes us an enemy of God. If we are friends to the world, we're an enemy of God. It's a tough thing to say that James is saying to us, but in effect, he's, he's alluding to the fact that it's actually cheating on God with the world. When we want things that the world has to offer, we're actually cheating on our God. That's why James calls us in this passage adulterers because we are covenant breakers. It's like breaking a marriage covenant. Then James gives the beginning. However, at this point, he, he kind of switches gears for a moment and he gives us the beginning of the solution for a lust for life. Remember, he says, and here's my final observation, God resists pride but gives grace to humility. James goes on to give his solutions, which we'll talk about in a moment. But what we are dealing with here is that God will resist pride in our lives, but he's constantly looking for humility. He will resist the pride, but he gives grace to those who are humble. He's, James is dealing with the problem that humans have been dealing with since the dawn of time. Me, 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 me first, me first. In a panic situation, we can see, we can see how this, this happens. I can remember uh, when, when we were visiting in, in a hotel one day and we had family, we were all together, we were down in Ann Arbor and we, we walk into, this, uh, into the pool room where the pool was and my daughter Olivia just suddenly decides she's going to go swimming. I mean, she's in her bathing suit, she's ready to go, but she jumps in the deep end. She is not a deep end swimmer at this point of her life. And I'm looking at her and I'm going, swim, swim. 
Like that's such good advice, right? She doesn't know how to swim already. So, and I'm just in a panic. All of a sudden, my sister-in-law, who is a first responder in the medical field, she just jumps in the water. She's just like, boom, there she goes. And we're like, oh, oh, I guess I should have done that. <laughs> that, that makes sense. Now, that's, that wasn't a selfish thing out of me, but a lot of times we are, we are apt to protect ourselves in a situation rather than those around us. That's why we have people like first responders who are just ready to go, just ready to do it, just ready to get in there, right? And, and, and even though that is a, is a loose metaphor, but there are times when we get in a panic and we can get in a situation and we start to think, what do I need to do for myself? That is not the wrong way of thinking, what do I need to do for myself? But in the same way, I kind of feel like it's, uh, remember uh, in, the, uh, in the, well, we don't have any flights right now, but you know, when you're flying, they always will tell you, when the masks pop out of the ceiling, the first thing you do is put one on yourself. To do what? To help those around you. So Lord, yes, bless me <laughs> so that I can be a blessing. That's what the prayer should be. If you only take the blessing, if you only do this, this is that lust that uh, James is talking about for your own self. And this is something that we have been dealing with way back even in, uh, um, in Genesis. But, and, and John talks about this. I mentioned it before. But he says this in John, 1 John 2, 26. For all that is in the world... The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it is of the world. All, all of the different problems that humans have and that we have been dealing with since the beginning of time can be pretty much categorized underneath these three items. And, and, and John is reverberating what we can clearly see all the way back to Adam and Eve. In Genesis 3, 6, looking at the temptation from the enemy to Eve, it says, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. So even back in Genesis, still dealing with what John says, the lust of flesh, the eyes, and the pride of life, look what, how this relates. The tree was good for food, the scripture says. This is the lust of flesh that John is talking about. Because the enemy appealed to the humanness of Eve. He appealed to her stomach. <laughs> to her hungry, her body. He said, look at the food. It's good food. Eat it. So he had one temptation that appealed to her body. And then we look at the scripture. It says that it was pleasant to the eyes. The tree was pleasant to the eyes. And here's what John is saying. The lust of the eyes. The, the looking at something that we want. And this is how the enemy appealed to Eve's sight, her sight, her vision, how she saw things. So he appeals to her flesh, he appeals to her eyes and her vision. And then lastly, and a tree desirable to make one wise. The enemy will come against us, our flesh, he'll come against us with our sight. And lastly, with the pride of life, as John calls it. The enemy can appeal to our intellect. If he can't get us in the body, if he can't get us through what we see, he will try to change how we think. And I think we can really relate this to what we as a nation are going through right now. Because the enemy is still at work in all of this. How can this be that he is moving around and he is still trying to get us to fear and he is still trying to see and appeal, you're going to go hungry, get what you can. You can't have all of this. I'm going to block your vision so that you can't see what moving forward looks like. 
and I'm going to appeal to your ego and to your intellect. These are the same three categories of lust or sin that we still deal with today. So keep these thoughts in place. Keep them in mind for a minute. Now let's look at some solutions that James brings up in chapter 4. Here are some of James's solutions. Verse 7 through 10. Therefore submit to God. So we have all these sins, the, the, the lust of flesh, the eyes, the pride of life. But James says here are the solutions. Therefore submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. I think that's pretty appropriate right now, isn't it? Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. James is kind of giving us a few messages here. And here are some of the actions that he is, that he is uh, stating in these, these solutions. The first one is to surrender to God. Therefore, he says, submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Submit and surrender to God. God, I surrender to you. When I don't know what to do, I know that I can surrender to him. Secondly, James is saying, draw closer to God. First, surrender to him, but also draw closer to him. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. See, it says, draw closer to him. At this time, we have a lot more time than we did two weeks ago to be able to draw closer to him. And you can draw closer to the Internet, you can draw closer to Netflix. You can draw closer to a lot of other things at this moment. But take this opportunity to draw closer to him in your submission. Thirdly, James, and I think this is an important one, repent of sin. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Now, he's not saying to be a gloomy person or to be in continual mourning. James is not saying that. He is saying, though, to repent over your sin, to see what you have done and say, Father, remove this from me. And part of repentance is not just saying something. It's also turning and doing something else. I had someone this week ask me the question, Pastor, do you think that this uh, this time is all about uh, 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 is it is it all about the judgment of God or just natural consequences? And this is a very good question to ask. It was a good question. However, I'm of the opinion and the belief that I am not qualified to answer that, and I don't know many people who are. So I, because I don't know, I treat them both the exact same way. If I, I don't know if it's natural occurrence. I don't know if it's the judgment of God. I don't know. Here's what I do know. I still stop and I repent either way. And then I pray either way. And then I, either, I intercede either way. Because there's no way that we as humans can know. And it doesn't matter anyway because here it is. Treat them both the same way. It's the same pattern. Repent first. So I repent. I repent for my sins. And I lament and I mourn and I weep for them. Because those are the things that separate me from being in the presence of God, not the love of God, but his presence begins to wane, not because of him, but because of me and pulling out and getting away from that. So I need to surrender. I need to draw close, and I do that through repentance. And then James says, display humility. I can't tell you how much being humble is one of those things that really changes not only yourself, but the environment around you. Humble yourselves, said James, in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. 
Surrender to him. Draw closer to him. Repent of your sins and display humility in all of the things that you do. James gives us this good direction to follow in these solutions. But I want to take it one step further. These are the things that we should do, but the question is, how do we then do them? Jesus himself dealt with these same issues. These different aspects of the lust of life has to offer. In fact, the snake didn't change his tactics very much over thousands and thousands of years. He used the exact same tactics on Jesus as he did on Adam and Eve from the beginning. So as we keep how he tempted Eve in mind, let's now look how he tempted Jesus, but how Jesus overcame those temptations. We know that the temptation of Christ happens very early on in his ministry. He's actually baptized by John the Baptist. Can you imagine being at that scene? I, when, I, when I think about that in Scripture and I think, you know, seeing John the baptize, baptizer baptizing Jesus the Christ, that's just an incredible picture. But here he is, he baptizes him, and God shows up and he says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. I am pleased in this my son. And right from that, after that is over, the scripture says, and then the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted. You know, we prayed the Lord's Prayer this morning, and we said, you know, we said, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Because the reason that we pray that, Jesus taught us to pray that, because God does not do any tempting. The enemy does it all. But the Holy Spirit can do the leading led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted. And he was tempted for 40 days. Excuse me, he fasted for 40 days, and on the 40th day he was tempted. The enemy showed up. So what I understand from I have not done a 40-day fast, I have a friend who's actually done two 40-day fasts, and he told me, Around day 37, 38, he can remember his stomach started to grumble again. After three days, your body can live without food and actually will begin to shut down and process what you already have and begin to eat from that and nourish itself. But after about 37, 38 days, the body has used up all its reserves and it begins to hunger again. It begins to say, Something's not right. <laughs> Obviously, we're starting to get hungry. So on the 40th day of his fast, his body is starting to get hungry again and coming out of that protection mode, and now it's just, I must have. And this is when the enemy pounces. And he comes to him, and he says, aren't you hungry but see, the first thing, as, as James taught us to do, this is the same thing that Christ did. Christ first surrendered to the Lord in this. He surrendered his flesh, his humanness. The devil comes to him and says, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. Now we have to look at this because now Jesus is becoming hungry again. And the enemy tempts his humanness and says, Turn the stone now into food and nourish yourself. Just as Eve, the, uh, he appealed to the humanness of Christ, his stomach, his flesh. It was good for food. Go ahead now and eat it. But Jesus has an answer for him. He says, it is written... Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. The bread will not save me. It will sustain me, but it will not save me. It's the word of God that saves me from the lust of flesh. 
So when we talk to people in recovery, and you, you might know this yourself, but when you talk to people in recovery, they are constantly sharing how they need to halt, right? Halt, H-A-L-T. They have to take care of themselves so they don't get hungry. They don't get angry. They don't get lonely, and they don't get tired. Halt. Because they can all be triggers that send them back into their addiction. Why? Because the body longs for what it cannot have if we deny it. But sometimes we need to stop and say, no, no, no. I will not let my flesh desire this. I am going to surrender to the will of God, not to what I want. So Christ surrendered to the will of God not to the temptation of the lust that he really wanted. In the same way, we must also surrender to God, as James has said. Secondly, just like James suggested, Christ did the same thing. Christ took this time to draw closer to the Lord. He drew away and was wandering in the wilderness for 40 days. He drew away. Then the devil showed him came to him when the food didn't work he came to him and he said let me take you and I will show you all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time he showed him all the different kingdoms and said I can give this to you this can all be yours just deny God the question always remains and still stands I believe were those really the enemies to give I don't know but he appealed to Jesus' sight. He appealed to his vision, to what Jesus saw. All of this that you see, the enemy can attack us because we know the scripture, without a vision, the people perish. And that's just another good word for saying without a purpose, without usefulness, without doing something that I feel that I have a purpose, we can begin to fail. And sometimes the enemy will come to you and block your sight and say, you don't have a purpose, you don't have a reason, you are not useful, you just sit on that couch and do nothing during this time. And the enemy can attack our minds and our purpose and our vision. But here was the answer of Jesus. He said to him, get behind me, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. When the enemy comes to attack you, you begin to worship God. Don't let the enemy attack your vision or your purposefulness because your purpose, ultimately, you were created to worship God himself. So when he comes and he attacks your vision, you say, I know what my purpose is, and you begin to worship in the presence of God. Draw closer to him. Get away from the humanness and the the blocked vision that we have and draw closer to him. Thirdly, Christ trusted in the Lord. Now this is interesting because Christ, I believe, is God. So why would Christ, who is God, trust in God? Well, it's pretty much for our benefit. (laughs) He was modeling this to us. Christ trusted in the Lord. And part of this, I wonder, sometimes, every now and then, Satan knew that this was the Son of God. But Satan maybe didn't know that he knew that he knew. Maybe he came to him and goes, maybe this isn't the Son of God. Let's just check this out. If I can get him to fail, we'll definitely know. So if the body didn't work, and if the vision didn't work, let's appeal to his life. Let's appeal to the pride of life. And then the enemy brought him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. Take your life into your own hands. Trust in yourself that you will be able to preserve yourself. 
It's the same tactic that he uses on us even today. Trust in what you know. Trust in what you've always done. Trust in yourself. And Jesus looks at him and he said, It has been said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Do not even take your eyes off of him for a moment. And even though Jesus did not need to repent, we do need to repent. Jesus had no sin to speak of, but we have plenty (laughs) that we can repent for. So he will appeal to our intellect, throw yourself down, mind over matter. But Jesus said, this is not good. I will not tempt the Father. I will not tempt the Father in the same way we do not tempt him. We go ahead and we repent from our sin and just like Jesus we display humility in our lives. And this comes from having a trust in the Lord. Jesus trusted in God. The lust of flesh, the lust of the eyes And the pride of life, pretty much everything that we deal with can be pretty much subcategorized into one of those places, under one of those. But like the young man in the story at the beginning, we can either desire the things that this world has to offer, desire them even more than breath itself, or we can breathe the air of God. We can look and desire the things of God with everything that is within us. I encourage you to take these action points over this week and pray for them and look to them and say, um, uh, help me, give me the strength, Father God. Holy Spirit, give me the strength to work through these actions and these different things. Help me, help me to surrender to you. Help me to draw closer to you. Help me to repent of my sin and finally to display my humility before you just like the model, just like the pattern that Jesus Christ set for us so that we can overcome this lust for life with the desire to live for him out loud. Amen? Amen. Could you stand with me this morning and let's close in prayer. Once again, Lord, you've given me a message that is so easy to preach and so difficult to live. But Father, I pray, Holy Spirit, I pray, Lord Jesus, I pray to you that you would help us to move through this and in spite of this, that we will look to you and surrender to you, that we will take this time and draw close to you, that we will repent. As a nation, we will repent. As a people, we will repent. And that we will display humility in all that we do Father, help us to live life and desire not this life, but desire a life with you. Help us to focus on you. Help us to give attention to ourselves and to others as we fill that great commission that you've called us to do. And even though we can't go out now physically, Help us to go out now spiritually in all that we can say, in all that we can do. Help us to focus our lives on what you have called us to in this time, for such a time as this. We are the church called for such a time as this. The church in this nation has never had to deal with something like this before. I pray that you would help us as a church 
not this, just this church, but all churches, to rise up for this time. And I pray this in your name. And I would pray that you would bless us and that you would keep us and that you'd make your face to shine upon us and be gracious to us, that you'd lift up your countenance and give us your peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Be blessed this week. Be blessed this week. Thank you.